It's Friday, and you know what that means. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, for the return edition, the third episode of the Cruel Summer Podcast. Well, it's third actually episode of seventh. Cobra Kai. Yeah. Yeah, it's the seventh. Third episode of the Cobra Kai part of the Cruel Summer Podcast, seventh total episode, because I forgot that, you know, uh, a millennia ago we did all the movies. Um <laughs> This is the Cruel Summer Podcast. It's brought to you by the Oh Hi, Oh Guys Productions, powered by RealNerdCorp.com, live on twitch.tv slash RealNerdCorp. If you didn't already know, I am your host for this evening. I uh, strike first and strike hard. I have no mercy. My name is Alex Swisher. Joining me, as always, is my trusty co-host. You may know him by his alter ego, Shmuel Cohen, uh, but I know him by Chad Porto. Chad, say hi to the people. Hi, people. And special guest joining us for this edition of the podcast. Uh, I think I can just say outright that he is Chad's favorite person and mine because uh, everybody loves him. It's Marcus Green. Hey. We uh, we weren't allowed to do the show again unless we had him on. That's what the sponsor said. Then I realized we didn't have any sponsors, and then I had a mental breakdown. And well, here we are. It's just yeah, one of them things. Um, we, uh, I, so the thing that I realized when uh, Chad asked me about having you on, Marcus, is that I was like, oh, Marcus, definitely. Like, I see your opinions about Cobra Kai all over Twitter all the time. Why are you not just a part of the show? <laughs> you know? Well, to be fair, it is the Ohio guys. So we, we had to add a little dash Louisiana on the show. <laughs> so oh, here we man, are. I'm excited. I'm excited, man. It's always a trip listening back to you guys. So being a part of it is going to be a completely different thing. But I'm looking forward to being Elizabeth Shoes character between <laughs> Daniel. <laughs> what, what a great comparison. Because, I mean, yeah, if anybody knows the relationship between myself and Chad, it's that we are definitely <laughs> Daniel LaRusso and we are Johnny Lawrence. So... <laughs> So, all right, here's the oh, question, man. though. I'm definitely more the uh, the Johnny personality, but I'm also the only Italian on the podcast. So, like, who are we? <laughs> oh, well. Like, if we're being honest, uh, like, <laughs> who's, ta- who's claiming stakes to what character? Well, huh? that's a good question. I'm going to go out on a limb and say that I'm Terry Silver. <laughs> <laughs> funny because i could just see chad being like the king of like being in, a, in a, like the smallest man in a room full of stupid people and going quiet <laughs> yes 100 percent. i mean it, honestly if we had to pick even though he is the only italian i think i have to as much as i hate to say it i have to give johnny to chad be, just because i think while we both have our moments of complete uh, black outrage where we just want to beat the hell out of someone. He definitely outdoes me on that front. <laughs> oh, especially lately. Like we we we're, we won't go into current events because we're trying to keep this show topical, not not current eventful. Uh, but especially last week, I've just been. <laughs> so funny enough, we, we were talking off air about the fact that we kind of divulged this show into thirty two ways Miyagi's trying to kill Daniel. <laughs> Yeah, a uh, hundred ways to die in California, and shockingly enough, from the grave, Miyagi comes at Daniel one last time. I was gonna say, man, he no matter where he's at, whether it's Reseda, California, or fucking Okinawa, Japan, Mr. Miyagi will not let Daniel Larusso live a peaceful life. <laughs> whether it's 1984 or 2020, fucking Miyagi's coming for him. <laughs> Hey, Danielson, I'm going to get you, motherfucker. <laughs> I, uh, I really think that this season, I don't, I don't know what my expectations for season three were of Cobra Kai, but I can greatly say that what actually happened kind of blew everything out of the water, like what I was expecting. So I, I, we, we should have really hammered down a format to how we want to talk about season three. We'll talk about the episodes, yeah. obviously. I guess we'll talk about the arcs first, because I think we did that 
in the other ones. I think that's right. So <laughs> we'll let the we'll let the photos decide. We're, th- that's how we're gonna do this. I got like eight photos. We're we're, we're gonna we're gonna roll through those. <laughs> we'll let those decide. So the big first arc obviously is the Miguel can't walk, and um, Johnny feels awful about it. Right. So yeah. This you know we 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 have this conversation especially you and me Marcus when we talked about like the like the Arrowverse stuff when that universe didn't completely suck the soul out of me. We mm-hmm. always talked about how some angles so, that's a wrestling idea some stories uh, or or you know storylines went too quickly how how they were hot shotted so to speak. Yeah. And I gotta say I really liked the slow build for this because this went on for what f- three four episodes. About, yeah, about three and a half, it felt like. Yeah. Um, I, I, honestly, I think that when well, actually it went well into probably the last f- three episodes of the season. Because even when they did the, what was it, the uh, Eagle Fang Karate. <laughs> oh, you're talking about in terms of the whole thing about his yeah, like, the full whole record. thing. Oh, gotcha, 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 yeah. Eagle Fang Karate, goddamn! Like that went well, on I like mean, almost probably even the entire season because that's kind of what was the catalyst for that awesome last episode was Miguel's injury. Yeah, yeah. that's what I was gonna say. Is that um, we see the whole build to he wants to throw the uh, the spinning hook kick, um, but yeah. he just can't work his legs properly until we get to that final episode and that final. Um, just insane like that's how these the this show has to end now it has to end on an insane fight um they've set the precedent and you see uh that you know th- it finally pays off it literally is a start to finish season arc that pays off it starts in the first episode pays off in the final episode of the season yeah it's uh it, it was definitely some good stuff i got to say i think this was probably my favorite season so far just Mine. because it felt like like uh, just an effortless ride through the episode. I didn't feel like sluggish. I didn't like get bored at any time. I was completely emotionally hooked for all the emotional points of the roller coaster, you know. So, yeah. But that 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 full season arc, like you said, with him was great. Like, I even like going back to the Arrowverse. We talk about a lot of times how they rushed moments that should have lingered. Like the fact that they actually kept him in that coma for a couple of eps and it kind of showed you the process of him coming out of it. I thought it was really good because you can't go through something as traumatic as that kid went through and just have, you know, him, him pop back up. Like, you know, he had a Senzu bean or something, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and in other shows, that would have been exactly how it was. He would have been up in the first episode. And then by the third, he's doing spin back kicks because that's just how some TV shows are. I'm glad they didn't do it with that because the the journey of Miguel being you know in a coma, then he wakes up and he's depressed, and, and then he doesn't want Johnny anywhere near him. And then it, I think it was like his grandmother's like you know you got to get your ass in there, dude. Come on, Blondie, let's step up. So then he starts yeah. the and then he like he pushes the phone on, on the on the tray. He's like you're gonna get up and you're gonna get that phone. And then Miguel just falls out of bed and Johnny's like shit. <laughs> all right, oh, shit. good. <laughs> all right, good try. You fell like a champ. <laughs> And then, like, you know, then it's the whole uh, um, physical therapy stuff. And then, it, you know, it, it culminates in Miguel, like, you know, I'm never going to walk again. Then he takes him to a D. Snyder concert and sneaks him in. Like, yeah, man, he's going to die. Can't, can't you just let him in the show? And the guy's like, stay strong, little man. And Miguel's like, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and then, God. like, <laughs> then he's listening. To, I, what was it? Um, was it I Want to Rock? Or no, yeah. it, it, was it? A, yeah, all right. And then he's listening to I Want to Rock, and then Johnny's like, you're your foot. And Miguel's like, I can't move my foot. And it's, just, it's like a great just slow build. And it leads up to that great scene where they throw out all the trash, like, like the, the wheelchair and the crutches and everything. Ah, it was, just, ah, it was just, just perfect. It was just such a – this show is perfect. <laughs> so one thing that I love about Miguel's arc is that they do not – they are not afraid to make you – laugh at someone who's going through hell Mm -hmm. Um, because the entire time 
I'm still like right there on the edge of my seat. Like God, I like I know Miguel is going to walk. He's got to be able to walk. Please, for the love of God, tell me that he's going to learn to walk again. And then when he finally starts moving his feet, and they get him in the harness, and Johnny's trying to get him to walk, and Johnny sets him on fire, uh, <laughs> and just and just all the bullshit. Like Johnny, just you would think that this was a bully trying to hurt this kid, but that's what I love is that Miguel. Even in his state in season three, he is not off limits. Um, they they are not afraid to make you hate any character, and they are not a make, uh, afraid to make you laugh at any character. Yeah, it's you know it kind of takes you through the full spectrum of the human experience because when you you know um, that character is you know a lot of times specifically for for you know Johnny the kind of moral compass for that guy you know so it kind of felt like through like the entire series, but specifically this season, like they've been healing each other. And I think the thing that's been cool with Miguel, you know, we watch anime and we, you know, and just a lot of TV and movies in general. And then kind of comes down to the thing, like sometimes after a serious injury like that, your body's healed. And it's not necessarily that that's holding you back, but it's your head, mm -hmm. yeah. you know? So in a lot of those instances, it was real cool to see. And it's also kind of felt like the thing, like when you're looking for something really hard, you can't find it. And then all of a sudden you're stopping, you get it. You know, so it's uh, that you know those moments was uh, really cool. And like you said, the the comedy thing, because how can you skip around? John? Like Johnny can't help that he's he's basically stuck in the eighties and doesn't really have any decorum or coof, if you will, when it comes to you know uh, emotional sensitivity. You know, all yeah. he knows how to be is how he, you know how, who he is. So the whole I'm gonna teach you about uh, hibachi, the hibachi grill, and <laughs> and Miguel's like, dude. None of that's true. And Johnny goes, yeah, probably not. But it gave me enough time to set up this diversion. And then he realizes he's on fire. <laughs> it's just so fucking... Uh, it's so good. Uh, there's, uh, Miguel's arc was so good. He also got to kind of reconnect with Sam, which was nice. And um, he kind of integrated himself with, uh, with Dimitri a bit, which was kind of a new... Uh, uh, a new wrinkle in, in, in the friendship circles, if you will. I thought that was pretty cool. Um, but yeah, his arc was pretty solid. And I think the best part about it was that his mother, I forget who plays her, really got to showcase a lot of acting because of her angst and, and fear over whether or not he's ever going to wa walk again. And I thought that was really great. Vanessa Rubio. I thought that was a really great uh, addition to, to the story arc was seeing a lot of his struggles through her eyes, her pain and resentment and fear. It, it, and it culminated into that wild second to last episode of the season where, uh, or third to last episode where Johnny and her went to uh, funky town. <laughs> <laughs> Best yeah. way to describe that. It, um, I think it, I think that kind of really helps show the dynamic of the show in that, I mean, you, like, so you have to think when it came to Johnny and the Diaz family, um, you know, initially, you know, Carmen thinks that he's you know, kind of an idiot, but he's mostly harmless. And Miguel thinks the fucking world of him. And uh, the, the grandmother wants nothing to fucking do with him. You know, sees the fucking devil in his eyes or whatever. And you slowly see how those relationships change and alter for good and for uh, the bad as season one, two, and three rolls on. And I love that. It's like season two ends and uh, season three begins with Carmen and Johnny at odds. And then, you know, Miguel's in the coma. So when he wakes up, he, him and Johnny aren't friends with each other. The only one in that family who now likes Johnny is the fucking grandmother, mm -hmm. is the abuela. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, uh, so um, yeah. it, it's really it, to me, it's really interesting that they're not afraid to play with dynamics of relationships. And uh, God, I think I think through somehow through m meme culture of everybody for years saying that Johnny Lawrence was not the bad guy, uh, the karate kid. It, we have somehow turned Johnny Lawrence into one of the most <laughs> surprisingly deep and dynamic characters in television. I don't even think it's meme culture. We, we've talked about it for months. Miyagi was trying to kill LaRusso for a reason. <laughs> he, 
a dick. He knew, he knew what was going on. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it really puts a whole new spin on that whole thing. But you know, his side, her side, and the truth. Because a lot of these things are just, you know, the whole good and evil thing is just about a perspective. You know, mm-hmm. all that stuff, you know, the whole thing with the Karate Kid, it was like, look, you know, it, it came off like one person was the dick and the other person, you know, was, you know, on the receiving end. But a lot of that stuff was may have been agitated by, you know, LaRusso. And we just didn't see it because obviously that was the narrative of the films at the time. So, you know, you know, they have a luxury of being able to do that, you know, with this series coming off those films that I don't know if you can kind of get away with with a lot of, uh, a lot of movies. Yeah. You're yeah. not. You're not wrong. So let's hop on down. What, what, what's the next one we got? Uh, we already talked about that. So let's talk about the trip to Okinawa. Okay, we'll, we'll get to some of the more individual story arcs here uh, in a second. But I, 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 this to me was, you know, the gratuitous violence is obviously why we're watching the show. <laughs> we're here to see teenagers beat the shit out of each other. But. The trip to Japan for Daniel was so rewarding emotionally for me. I don't know how you guys felt about it, but I personally liked the second Karate Kid film best. Partly because of the characters that were introduced in this part of the saga, if you will. Um, Kumiko, you know, Tamlin Tamita as a kid. Oh my God, such a crush. And to see her, even though she's in her 50s, I think now, still beautiful with that s- smile, man. Ah, <laughs> it got me. Uh, it got me in ways. So seeing, like, seeing that whole scene play out where Daniel you know, hops on a plane to Okinawa, drives out to where the, the, the city used to be to find out that it's now been turned into a strip mall. And, and he, he's just like walking around despondent like the hell. And then he turns to the <laughs> stage and he sees the little kids doing their little Okinawa dance. And then he, he realizes that the person leading them is, of all people, Kumiko. And like that was nice. But then, to meet his face when, when Kumiko sees Daniel and like just the expression of utter joy in, in a moment in Daniel's life of nothing but misery. Ah, it's just, it's just so good. <laughs> Which is only parlayed even better off of the, the face Daniel makes when he sees God, goddamn cho- uh, Chosen in the same episode. Oh, uh, I, I, I just, just everything about it. It just oh, it made, it made me so happy. So, so, so like Vegeta walked in on Goku with Boma. <laughs> Basically. <laughs> it's, it's, um, it is definitely... I would say it's one of the best parts of the season. And, and normally, like, I'm very much on the side of, you know, ride or die with Johnny Lawrence. But, like, this this moment and the, his trip to Okinawa really kind of solidifies um, that Daniel isn't – I don't – it really it, – the whole point of this season to me is the – is trying to get Daniel and Johnny to get their heads out of their asses mm-hmm. and see the world for what it really is and that they're not the heroes of their own stories. They like to think that they are and that they're they're living a shared rivalry with the bad guy, the villain of their story. But, you know, Daniel has to come to terms with the fact that the reality that he's grown up with isn't the one that's true because all the interactions with Chosen and everything that he learns about Miyagi-Do karate um, – and him going back and, and reconnecting with Kumiko and, you know, the surprise there at the very end of that trip, um, you know, with the third person that he meets, which just so happens. What a what a hell of a uh, I mean, I could probably just go ahead and get into it. Um, we, well, so the reason that Daniel is traveling to Japan is because he's trying to he, he goes to Doyona International, which is a car like. It's a Toyota conglomerate. Yeah, it's, a, it's, it's here's Toyota. what it says on the Wikipedia. It is a marketing conglomerate that handles international sales for Asian automobiles. Um, so he goes there trying to get his deal with uh, Doyona back because Tom fuckhead, other Valley car guy. Uh, That's Tommy like, hey. Shafter of Titus High Performance, sir. 
<laughs> I'm not kidding. That's David Satroff. And, and, and his character ends uh-huh. up yeah, trying to buy out the uh, uh, the LaRussos. Yeah. Um, and so when he gets there, he, he, he goes on this whole amazing journey learning about Miyagi-Do and reconnecting with uh, Kumiko and, you know, seeing Chosen again for the first time. Um, which is a hell of a relationship to have with someone. Uh, and then he meets Yuna uh, and sees, the, you know, Yuna, the little girl that he saved during the typhoon, uh, that Miyagi definitely didn't send him Daniel up there <laughs> to save her so that he might die. Daniel, go save the girl, but I'll die. Oh, well. <laughs> <laughs> Two birds, one stone. <laughs> that is a ri- I was gonna say that is a risk I am willing to make. <laughs> <laughs> but Mr. Miyagi, I uh, might die. Eh. <laughs> <laughs> I've always so, been a Johnny. It fan. turns out that she, <laughs> she's a sales rep for for Doyona, and it all it all comes full circle, and everything's great. But uh, it it's like a great. It is that moment of like, man, how the, in the same way that. Season one of Cobra Kai was so nostalgic because you get to relive that that karate kid nostalgia from the first movie. Season two was kind of a departure from that, and it was focused more on the kids, um, which I mean the series should be mostly about the kids in the first place. But season three is like, hey, you like Karate Kid 2? Well, I fucking hope so because you're about to get hit with that nostalgia. And they set that up for being for season four, being like, "Hey, I hope you like Karate Kid three as well." <laughs> See, seeing the 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 young girl uh, at at the end, now a full woman, and realizing that that is literally still the same actress. Ah, uh, this show is yeah. this show is hitting in all the right notes, man. So, I guess uh, for some of those fools on the internet that we talked about. A lot dealing with uh, Snyder fans. That would be the Martha scene, Chad. You know, let it be the Martha th- scene. Because I still think the Martha scene was good. I am fine with it. <laughs> Granted, it is yeah. a wildly convenient plot arc that the girl that Daniel saves all of a sudden now has an in with the Toyona group. Like, all right, listen. <laughs> yep. Not w- just Not just an in. But what is it? Uh, she is a senior vice president of sales. But listen, <laughs> so she's she's got power. The literal, she's literal. The literal answer to his prayers. Yes, <laughs> but if we're gonna believe that Johnny can make a child walk to D. Snyder, and that someone yes. isn't still flushing a kid, you know, head first into a toilet for wearing a mohawk, if we can believe these two things to be true. I don't think this is that far of a stretch. Because we have to remember, Hawk is a doofus. Who's got a yeah. mohawk in 2020? Uh, I agree completely in, in the fact that, look, I hate that this this kid gets picked on for this, you know, thing on his lip, the birth defect, you know, the what, you know, whatever you want to call it. Like, it's a it, hair it, lip. It's his face. It's his face. He, he's only got one of them, and he can't do anything about it. But you can do something about that hair, and right. you're not doing yourself any favors. Or fucking, his shitty tattoos. Fucking uh, uh, red rooster-looking motherfucker. <laughs> <laughs> All right, yeah, we're good. <laughs> so it was great to see, uh, I think her name was Yuna. Uh, that, that was just yep. a, a delightful scene. Um yeah. Uh, da- down the rat. Well, let, let, we, we, we before we move on to what I was about to talk about, uh, we had, we do have to talk about Chosen because he had a real big arc in this uh, uh, season. Even though he really only had one episode, granted he was in two, but he was only really in one. He taught Daniel the truth of the Miyagi Do karate. Basically, Daniel learned the uh, the the free to play version. <laughs> While Chosen played for the yeah. premium. <laughs> Apparently, Miyagi tried to control the, le- the, the truth of the, the, the karate, which was that it was for um, defense purposes with a, a focus on killing in the name of. 
So Chosen's like, yeah, Miyagi-Do Karate was designed to um, kill individuals with your bare hands like, in, in terms of combat. So like when people would, would rush the village or whatever, you know, if you knew Miyagi-Do Karate, you could kill someone. And, and, and that's why Miyagi didn't want to teach you because, you know, you're a bitch. And Daniel's like, I'm not a bitch. And Chosen's like, oh, da, 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 da. you want to die? No, I see you're a bitch. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, to be fair, Chosen did kind of have some Dale Gribbleness to him, especially uh, when he uh, uh, did the callback to uh, the second movie where he honked Daniel's nose. Oh, and then he's like smiling. Ha ha, I got you. So, it, he, oh, it's not even like a smile. Ha ha, got you. He goes in for that final strike and then he honks Daniel's nose and he full on belly laughs. He's, ha 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 ha. Uh, it, was, uh, it was so good because they, they telegraphed it with a flashback and you were anticipating the honk, but the way they sold it, you didn't know. But when he did that, I kind of I kind of laughed as hard with him as I cried as hard when Kamiko was reading back them damn letters, man. Oh, oh. man. Forget, forgot about those. The, uh, the Miyagi love letters to his long-lost love. Oh, it's so good. Scene, uh, host. Broke me, man. Auntie Yuki? Yeah, Yuki. Was that? Yeah, Yuki. Uh, yeah, the man, when when she got to the part and she was like, this, uh, what's what's the date on, oh, he, or no, Daniel sees the date and he's like, this is, uh, this was written the week that Mr. Miyagi passed away. I went, oh no. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> and then he's like, she's like, do you want me to read it? And he goes, uh huh. And I go, no, 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 <laughs> don't do this to me. No. <laughs> Uh, uh, I I I love that Miyagi was still eat, having his, his shit eating grin personality. I am back in the hospital. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> just so blase about it. <laughs> Miyagi, don't ever change. <laughs> I mean, you can't. You're gone, but still, don't ever change. I would be remiss if I didn't bring up the simple fact that did you guys notice there was still that little. That little chemistry between uh, uh, um... Kumiko and Daniel. Yes. Yes. Oh no! I mean, I mean, I mean, you could you could smell it coming off. <laughs> but and and this is kudos to David. This is such a well casted show. His wife is so damn good in this show. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and it's like, dude, like even like childhood crush or not, your wife, like she looks great. She's smart as hell. She has your back. She don't. She wants. She's going up and slapping crease, which we'll get to. Like, come on, man. Like that's, like he he got he got a great problem. <laughs> is, is all you can say. I loved the lingering of, of of the hands in that scene, and then like they kind of slowly pull them away, and I loved the whole. I you know I think she said something to the extent like, if we had Facebook, I wonder if we would have lost touch or lost contact. Like it, yeah. it's it's such a heartbreaking thing to say, and like when he asks Kumiko, like, ha, have, "Did you ever find someone?" She's like, "Well, there's been some, but you know, no one's ever fought to the death for me before since you." <laughs> so you know, it's kind of hard uh, to die. What? <laughs> what? Like it really like that's one of my favorite things. Um, so you have like the two main women of the show being. Um, is Amanda, Daniel's wife, mm-hmm. is Amanda, and then you have yeah. Carmen, you know, Miguel's mom. Yeah. But one of my favorite things about the season is they, like, bringing back Allie Mills Schwarber, you know, but or Allie Mills yeah, now. No, you know? no more Schwarber. Um, yeah, and then you have Kumiko as well, and it's like the – it may be more so that the test of Will was there for Johnny than it was meant to be there for Daniel, but, like, I, I love – they cannot help but mirror the lives of the two main characters. And they are the main characters. This whole thing revolves around Johnny and Daniel. And they can't help but mirror it in certain moments when Allie shows up and she reconnects with Johnny. And when Daniel goes to Japan and he reconnects with Kumiko. You know, it's it's all about the, the timing and the way they play it out. Like, these... And that's why I think the ending of season three is really great because even you see the glimpses of it throughout seasons one and two that these two have more in common than they have, you know, to hate each other. Mm-hmm. So 
why like it's just they're so fucking pig headed stubborn that they can't see past their own noses that they they're they're not looking at the enemy they're just looking at a guy that they they fought a couple of times yeah you know. so let's hop on over to what i thought was both the most surprising arc and also the most disappointing only because of the least amount of time it was truly given and that was the tory arc of the season Yep. Which really had so much promise. And now, granted, it doesn't mean that we're not going to deliver on it. It just means that we weren't given all that we could in this season. The way John Kreese played to her insecurities and ego all at the same time to win her back into coming to, to Cobra Kai was fantastic. The also the, the setup to like sh- her mother's got, you know, renal failure her little brother is, is you know, basically left at home all by himself whenever she's at work and she's working two jobs to make sure they don't get evicted. And the guy, you know, who, who's, you know, threatening to evict them is, is trying to seduce a 16-year-old girl. So, you know, yikes. Yeah. R- real strong uh, setup. And then Kreese comes in, kind of wins her over by beating the shit out of the guy and making sure she doesn't get evicted. So she shows back up to practice. And I liked all of that because it really kind of built the, the formation or, or, or the foundation, I should say, of what she could become as a character in terms of the depth. But they kind of defaulted back to the end of season two with her where she's just kind of terminating her way to get to Sam. Like, she was the T-1000, yeah. the bitch 1000, if you will. Yeah, yeah it's it's they, 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 they feel like they get to do with her what they – they took a step back with Hawk with, um, mm-hmm. cause we'll get to what happened with him, but it's like, yeah, that, that was building. Cause you did get to see some of that home life and got to see some of those wheels turning of, of the whys of the character, specifically when she sat down, um, with Miguel. But yeah, man, like it, at the end, it did come kind of come off like that. This will never be over gadget. Like it just, like, why? <laughs> why? Yeah. She really got turned into, like, the soulless machine that's just set out to kill. Um, and it really kind of sucks because you see, when she's introduced in season two, you, like, yeah, she's got, you know, her mom's got the renal failure. She's trying to take care of her family. And, like, she's just been screwed over and get been dealt a bad hand. And, like, she's not a bad kid. She's just got, you know, her head mixed up and, she you know, she only knows one way out. And when you're presented with only one way out, that's the only way that you're going to go. Um, but in this, it's like they don't even try to make the fight. Like, she's just at the point of being so far gone that there's no point in making the fight of trying to be like, no, 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 no. We don't have to do this. There's another option. And she's just like, no, fuck you. I'm going to kill you. I'm like, straight up, Tracy Smothers, ultra mega mass homicide. Everybody dies. Yeah, you know? it's... It's almost to the point where it's like if you, I feel like if you gave her all the money she would need to not only like help her mom and then like elevate her situation and give her like a real deep love interest of Miguel, the way that they that they're, they're doing her, it's like she still would try to kill Samantha <laughs> just for the f of it, and it's like ah I don't know. So I agree, I agree completely, but I also think that's part of the idea with her is. They're really trying to build up the, the Cobra Kai side of things. And I, I don't want to boil him down to this, but I'm going to have to. That's why they brought back the Japanese kid, <laughs> who's the wrestler. Because they're really trying to hit home with the Cobra Kai is full of douchebags now. Which is also why they did what they did with Hawk, but we'll get there in a second. Um, the, the best way to just kind of describe the Peyton, the, uh, the Tori, uh, Sam arc, Marcus, is this is... This is Karate Kids, you know, season five of Arrow. This this is uh, uh, Oliver and um, uh, um, what's his name? Crap. Chase. Yeah, yeah, Chase. Yeah. I, like, like that's yeah. this. Like, you know, there's gonna be a scene where Sam's like, I, I whatever I did, I'm sorry, and Tori's just gonna say, I know, I just don't care. <laughs> hey, and if they do drop that line, I'm just, Marcus, I'm gonna run to your house and high five you. <laughs> And then I'm going to die because I ran to Louisiana. <laughs> just just sprinted like Flash. Marcus, I did it. <laughs> It'll take oh, me three man. weeks to get there, but I'll, I'll, I'll run and high-five you. 
there won't be a single fluid left in your body. Oh no, I'll be I'll I'll, I'll basically just be the uh, the corpse from uh, Corpse Bride and just high five. It's just just all mummified. I'm Emotep. As I say, if you wanted to keep it if you wanted to keep it tied into like Arrowverse and DC, is you're gonna be Ray al Ghul pre Lazarus Pit. You're just gonna be a fucking dried up piece of beef jerky. Basically, I'll be Ray al Ghul in Batman Beyond. I'll just be a figment of someone's imagination. <laughs> <laughs> all right he's gonna have to high five a ghost <laughs> so let's talk about the big return of the season which was uh uh well actually the big return didn't actually technically happen yet but it's gonna happen I promise you that jenny <laughs> so um we get the return of uh elizabeth shoe <laughs> couldn't remember her name <laughs> shut up <laughs> Too many, too many damn names. Allie Mills, there it is. We get her, and sh- she looks as great as ever, man. Oh, she's fantastic. Yeah, she, she, she looks so much, you know, so great seeing her as a non shape shifting. <laughs> oh my <laughs> god, that's right. Why must you remind me of these things, Marcus? Where she's been, we're hanging with a homicidal superpowered maniac all these years. She didn't put that on Facebook. She, she, here she is hanging out with Homelander, dealing with his ass, and then she shows up to deal with Johnny, and she's like, "Man, this is a walk in the park comparatively." I mean, you're right. I, I completely forgot about the fact that she was in the boys. I forgot that was her, but she was also in uh, Adventures in Babysitting, Back to the Future Two and Three, uh, Hollow Man. So, like, yeah. Love me some Elizabeth Shue. And I love that she broke down the entire Irish. She's like, you guys were both assholes. And I was an asshole. We were all assholes. <laughs> like, why are you still pretending that one of us was the good one? <laughs> and I was just like, yup, yeah. yup, Elizabeth Shue dropping the uh, the knowledge bombs. So you, you got to appreciate that. Like Her her, her entire thing, what, to, well, she was brought back essentially just to jumpstart Johnny into being a decent human being. So I, I appreciated that. And, like, I was concerned that Johnny would fall into bad habits and old habits with her, and he almost did. But at the end of the, the her arc, she's like, you know, is, is there a woman in your life? And he's like, yeah, I think there is. And, like, off he went to, to go claim his lady. I, I like that. I, I, I like that he got to experience his youth again, but he didn't fall back into the trappings of looking behind him when he could be looking ahead of him. I thought that was a great idea. It's I um I really think that her purpose was not only to just jump start Johnny uh and get him back on track, which I mean he was already on his way. Um because that, you know Miguel is also serves that purpose, but I think she was there to help Johnny help provide Johnny some closure mm-hmm. of of like look, we were teenagers, you know, like I like things happen it's not going to be perfect. It's not going to always work out, but it's like, I like the fact that she said, even though everything that happened, I still had a great time with you. You know, it was still like so much fun to be with you and to be around you. And like it, again, it helps take away that stereotype and that painted light of Johnny being the, the bully, you know, the quote unquote bully of, um, you know, karate kid, where it's like, you only see the bad between Johnny and Allie in Karate Kid, and it's not like you don't get to see the good of all that I'm sure that they had before Daniel showed up and ruined everything. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it really, it really does help provide more context and more background for for Johnny as a teenager, um, and it, you get a lot of that. I, this is a lot. This whole season is a lot of background and and you know more details because. Um, you get the return of what's his fa- uh, uh, Johnny's stepdad in season three, the the dickhead old man. Yeah. Oh, man. Uh, um, yeah. Oh, uh, duh, duh. Ed Asner. Yeah. And the, I again, I think these characters are all being brought in because you have to see Johnny. We have to see Johnny through everybody else's eyes because if you can only take Johnny through – what you see Johnny do, you're like, well, of course you want to love this guy because he tries his best, but he's a, a perennial fuck up. Mm-hmm. Um, whereas like Allie doesn't see him that way. 
Allie sees him as a kid who just like ne- sees him as a kid. He never, he never, you know, he never really got it together, but he he never really did anything wrong either. Yeah, it's uh, it's interesting. Like you look at that character, and it's like it, it's kind of hard to, to judge him when you see he like the stuck between that old the decrepit fart and crease. <laughs> That's what that was his building blocks to manhood. Come on, man. Yeah. It's like he turned out as good as he did. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, and that's like one of the things that I really like about this show is that they they are taking everything that, and I, especially with season three and them going back to Okinawa, they're taking everything that we thought we knew about these movies, not changing anything, but just flipping the view so that more details they're adding more, they're revealing more, they're painting the whole picture for us that we never got because, you know. Yes, the stories of Karate Kid 1, 2, and 3 are all connected through Daniel um, and Mr. Miyagi. But Karate Kid 2 is its own disjointed, separate thing. Like, you know, it it doesn't bleed over until you get to Cobra Kai Season 3. So, it's interesting. No, go on, Marcus. Sorry. No, I was just just thinking about when Switch was, like, going through, like, talking about the relationships real quick. Like, going through from Carmen to uh amanda uh yumiko um and and ali um none of these all these women are three-dimensional and none of them feel like the same person mm-hmm. yeah and it's 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 real cool the way that they're having different effect effects on on these guys and, and just the story in general but none of them feel like the same person and it's like there's not a bad option in any of them but but it's a good thing that they did that they allowed her to come in and have an effect on these two without making it like oh my god like uh, Johnny's gonna cheat on such and such with her uh, or, or is, is what's called it gonna kind of try to dip on out on his wife between her and Yumiko like they didn't go that soap opera route like they just kept it adult and they kept it you know continue to go down the narrative of the story because like Switch said these these two got to get their head out of their asses. Because it's it's bigger than them now. It's about these kids that that potentially had the opportunity to be far more than they ever had the chance to be. So, you know. Yeah. I think the thing that kind of works for the show and, and why it's acceptable to, to re-examine the movies through the eyes of Cobra Kai is, is exactly what, what Elizabeth Shue's character said in, in what, the, the, the last episode of the season, I think. Where she basically is like, you know, there's your side, there's your side, and then there's the truth. And I think that's kind of what we're seeing with, with the reexamination of the, the Karate Kid franchises. We saw it from Daniel's side. We're also seeing it now from Johnny's side. But we're also seeing it from reality. And it's not, re, it's not restructuring anything or rewriting anything. It's recontextualizing it. And I think it's fine to do that because in the movies, we only see it from Daniel and Miyagi's side. You know, with this show, especially season three, we saw what happened to Chosu afterwards where he's like, yeah, my uncle forgave me after, you know, throwing my ass back out into a typhoon. <laughs> technically, yeah. technically, he ran out into a, into a hurricane, but still. <laughs> but like... They're they're reexamining these moments again, and, and they're putting them into proper perspective, and and it's adding depth to these moments because you know, th- these characters aren't written to be perfect. So the idea that Miyagi was always one hundred percent honest with, with Daniel, no, I I would never believe that in a, in a second because Miyagi's trying to protect Daniel. So sometimes you got to lie to the kid, but. I don't have an issue with that because it doesn't frame Miyagi in a negative light. It frames him in a human light. Of course Miyagi doesn't want Daniel to know that, that Miyagi do Karate ha- had a basis in, in murdering people. <laughs> yeah. Could be why it used yeah. to be called Murder Do Karate, but, you know, whatever. Yeah. You know, just ignore that yeah. plot point, apparently. <laughs> and, and to be fair, that, that technique doesn't even coincide with it. I think a lot of it had to do with him knowing Daniel intrinsically deep down. Like, that, that technique doesn't even coincide with who Daniel is. Because mm-hmm. that's that's not something he takes. That wouldn't be something he takes pleasure in doing. He doesn't even really want to fight. You know the you know the whole art of karate just allowed him to be, you know, kind of more than he was. Kind of like he was doing with uh, Johnny's kid. 
you know, it, it kind of brought out the, the betterment in it. But that technique is is more so a last resort for somebody like Daniel because it's literally, you know, you disarm somebody completely. And you it, It's like a murder-death kill if we talk about <laughs> demolition. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, you know, uh, I, yeah, I 100% agree. I, I think it, it really does show, um, it adds just another layer of depth to the whole thing of we really, even in years after his passing, you see how wise Mr. Miyagi was and that he saw a kid that came from a pretty shitty background and he saw a kid that had nothing to his name and was getting the shit kicked out of him on a weekly basis. And instead of being someone like Kreese, who had he taught those to Daniel, whether or not Daniel you know, needed them or not, had he taught them to Daniel, maybe he would have stoked the flame a little too much. And maybe that, that you know, anger that was kind of boiling over inside LaRusso as a, as a young kid with nothing to his name and nowhere to go, you know, and, and kind of being the, the, the small, the teenager who's kind of pissed off at the world, but not so much in Daniel's case. Um, you know, that if you, all it takes is a little bit of, you know, fanning that fire to get him to turn into just a, you know, a quote unquote killing machine. And Miyagi and all of his infinite wisdom of um, trying to, trying to kill Daniel and not get Daniel killed uh, or not get Daniel to be the killer is what I meant to say. Um, he, he realized that he needs to teach him defense and not offense. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I like, it's so crazy that like, if you would ask me if, if we were like, oh, I can't wait for them to recontextualize all of Karate Kid in season one of Cobra Kai and make you deep dive and think about the effects that it has across the entirety of the four movies that preceded it. Well, three at least. Um, you know, I, I would be like, you're out of your fucking mind. This is going to be about Johnny Lawrence being a badass. <laughs> you know, But uh, it, it's like so crazy how they've developed this story and they've developed the stories of the movies along with it and it's like why can't every fucking TV show be this good <laughs> you're not wrong so let's real quickly talk about the arcs of the rest of the characters um, so we got Amanda LaRusso she's losing her car thing and then she's not good job Courtney well, Henningler she Oh, and then she slaps um, Trees. Okay, two points. Yeah. It it becomes, she's like, we're going to handle this like adults, to her going, we can't handle this like adults, he's a sociopath. And both of the guys are like, we told you. Yeah, it's like, this is what we were trying to say from the beginning. And she's like, I'm sorry, I just couldn't see it over your flashy sidekicks and, you know, your jumping double knees. And your, you know, sideburns. Uh, <laughs> Robbie gets arrested and spends eight episodes in prison, then gets let go and hangs out with, uh, with crease and then goes like Stepford karate kid, I guess. Dad, join, Car- <laughs> join Cobra Kai again, join Cobra Kai, dad, dad, join crease, dad. Oh my God. You should have had a late term abortion, man. Robbie's is the I, worst. <laughs> I, I feel 100% vindicated in my feelings towards Robbie up to this point. Uh, it's, <laughs> yeah. It's funny because somebody, Somebody doing a review video said, uh, and here we go again with the poor man's version of Jonathan Taylor, Tom. (laughs) 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 This was a huge point of contention talking about seasons one and season two between myself and Chad. And I, the entire time I was just like, I just don't like Robbie. I can't like him. There's something about him that makes me not like him. I was like, I don't know if it's the actor himself or if it's just the way that they're portraying this kid. But, man, when everybody's trying to help him, it doesn't matter who it is. It doesn't matter if it's Daniel, who's done right by him this entire time. And the only reason he hates Daniel now is because he got him sent to juvie because he was, you know, trying to lessen the sentence Robbie would get for kicking, for nearly killing Miguel. Mm -hmm. Um and his dad tries to do right by him and it's, you know, screws up most of the time, you know, but he's still trying his best. Like this kid, re- like, it's just one of those scenarios. Like, I know that he gets a little bit more help and a little bit more like actually like waveringness towards like maybe making the right yeah. choice than Tori does. But it's, it's, <laughs> yeah, it's, 
It's weird because it's almost like you can compare it to it's like Anakin turning on uh, Obi Wan and going with the Emperor. Yeah. It's like, it's like dude, you you know this not gonna end well, right? Like, no, I'm gonna help him. He's gonna save Padme. No, what he told you was, <laughs> yeah, I might be able to do it. It's what basically what he said, and you just went on ahead because you needed to believe it could happen. But uh, yeah, I just you're not alone in that. I don't know what it is, like you said, and a, a lot of people can't pinpoint it. I think it's 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 just the actor comes into these scenarios and just doesn't fit, and, and because of that, people just don't care. Like they know he's important to the plot because he's, uh, you know, Johnny's son. But if he wasn't Johnny's son, it's like you could leave the show and we wouldn't care, you know? <laughs> yeah. Um... I actually really like that comparison because, like, it's he's got he's got some of the best people around him trying to help him the same way Anakin does. I mean, and like, no matter he just keeps making all the wrong choices, and even when he makes the wrong choices, they're like, nah, you know, you screwed up, but you need to deal you need to deal with the consequences of your actions, and then we can help you from there. And the entire time they're like, hey, you just got to deal with the consequences of your actions. He goes, no, uh, uh-uh. uh. He's like a child. He literally is the most childish of all of the actual children in the show. Um, and that's and that's me even saying that about Sam LaRusso, who this season was insufferable. I liked her more than I liked Robbie. I didn't have an issue, and, and that's a, a nice segue because that's who we're pivoting to next. I didn't have an issue with Sam this season. I thought everything she went through was the most logical thing possible. Now, let's be clear. The show is not logical. You don't have a gang fight in a in a school, and the worst thing that happens is someone gets sent to a probation officer. Like, no. <laughs> like, y'all getting yeah. expelled. <laughs> so, like, oh, yeah. th- this 100%. entire show doesn't exist in a realm of reality. And I accept that. That's fine. I'm all right with that. But I think that's maybe why Sam's arc this season may, maybe didn't jive with you, uh, Switch, because of that fact that Sam's arc was very realistic in a not-so-realistic universe. She had PTSD after watching her love interest, boyfriend, ex-lover, then also current lover, kicking the shit out of each other until one dude fell onto a goddamn hand railing three stories down. So she's a little fucking twisted about yeah. that. Plus, some bitch tried to stab yeah. her over a right. boy. I get right. her insecurities. <laughs> um, I think the biggest issue with this is, um, and and you know what, it, you 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 raise a really good point in that she completely one hundred percent is justified in the way that she acts. Mm-hmm. Um, however, I I take umbrage and take issue with characters that are very much put all the blame on me characters um you know the the refu- and again she's justified in in refusing to see things from you know the outside points of views that people are trying to provide her with um just based off of her experiences of the last year you know several months it's not even been a year it's been like four months or whatever um it but the the very much so it's like the reason Miguel got kicked off was because of me. No, well, yes, but also no. The reason Miguel got kicked off the ledge is because Robbie's an asshole. Um, the, the reason I got stabbed was because of me. I started all this. Yes, but also no, because, you know, they're painting Tori to be a psychopath. Technically, uh, Miguel started all of it. Yeah, true. Um, you know, oh, uh, Dimitri gets his arm broken because of me. Well, yes and no. Again, that it, one, all... I think that one actually does, I think, bear some weight, because if she had come out, she wouldn't uh, uh, Tori wouldn't have broken it. Like That was the whole point of the of the, of the right. scene. It's like that one I allow. But I do agree right. with you with and, the rest. But I, uh, I think I don't I also like I think like, yeah, she didn't walk out and face um, Tori. So, of course, they broke Dimitri's arm. But at the same time, it's like I, f- I have a feeling that even if she had walked out and faced Tori, they would have broken Dimitri's arm. So it's. A lot of her uh, her story in this is very much like it's like well yeah I see what you're saying and you do raise a good point and you have valid reasoning but also these reasons exist as well and you need to see outside yourself which I think she kind of gets that perspective when she goes fishing with Daniel um, 
you know, and they have this big talk, uh, the the big defining moment for her, um, and helping her come around to to wanting to do Miyagi Do again. But it's just like, in order to get there, she has to be a little bit annoying, and it, you know, it, it's still not like again, it's still not Robbie bad or like Tori bad this season where it's like I could have done without all of this. It's like no, well this was needed, you know, just mm-hmm. because it's a little bit annoying that you know kind of makes it it irks me. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's interesting, but it, um, I, I guess for me, uh, I'm gonna lean more towards Chad because it did it did like PTSD is a, is a very uh, tricky thing, and we we see it so poorly handled in uh, a, a lot of other shows and, and movies and, and such. So this was because, like you said, not only did he uh, she witness trauma, she almost like the girl was trying to kill her, like the yeah. whole you know, the intercom. I'm gonna kill you, Larusso. Like it's like okay, all right. Freaking Callisto from Xena. Okay. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, it, it kind of really showed that she is her father's daughter because he told her that great story. Like, look, when I was in that tournament, I thought I was, you know, I thought I was the shit, and then I was getting my ass kicked, and I was scared. And it, and it kind of, you know, in a lot of ways, she she does have that, that brave and, and that kind of a soulful spirit. But I think a lot of times in, in scenarios like this, people look at fear, um... I guess in the wrong way because we kind of look at it as like this reluctance to act when really it's awareness mm-hmm. of a situation. And I think again the whole thing about this this show is is giving you proper perspectives on everyday things. So you know, like you said, when she went on that that fishing trip with him, um, and then I forgot what it was the exact turnaround moment for her. Obviously, she had to go snap into it when she was fighting her, but you know, it's 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 moments like that that we appreciate because again she could have they could have just did a moment where she kind of just snapped out of it in that moment when Demetrius about to get his arm broke and she kind of like turned you know power ranged it up or something and stopped everybody but that didn't happen you know it was real consequences of the action but I can I can understand like you said it's you know that that whole you know everything has to be on me type of deal does get annoying specifically when it's it's an overused and I know Chad hates this thing uh, this word trope in so many shows, but it's, it's, you know, it's the hero thing. Yeah. So Samantha LaRusso had to have character rehabilitation like Miguel needed physical rehabilitation. That's how this season went for me in regards to Sam. <laughs> um, sure. John Kreese, we'll, we'll, we'll do his real fast because it's simple. We got a lot of flashbacks of him. Uh, he, he was a, a martial artist in the 60s when I guess that was not common. I mean, that makes sense. Uh, he beat up a bunch of um, thick necks, I guess we'll call them. It wooed the girl thick of his necks. dreams. Uh, and then the girl dies in a car accident, but he's never told about it because he, he joins a new platoon. And, and they're like, hey, John, we're not going to tell you about this because we need you to be focused. And then they get captured because John refuses to blow up a bunch of his buddies. And then his commanding officer is like, you're a dumbass. And then we're all going to die because of you. And then... He's like, if I ever get my chance to kill you, I'm going to. And then he got a chance to kill him. Then he kicked off his commanding officer into a pit of snakes as they're being rescued. No. Villainry no. 101. No, no, man. Y'all, y- y'all got to tell me if you agree with me on this. The stupidest thing that happened all season. You this guy's commanding officer. You guys are about to fight over a pit of uh, endless CGI snakes. You are so confident in yourself that you're about to win. You're going to tell this guy, before you get to the pit of snakes, that his girl died and you didn't tell him about it. You didn't think that was going to help him kick your ass? <laughs> like, really, you're going to wait until the last second to, to, to really get him in the mood to like, there's no reason for me to not make sure you die whether the snakes get you or I kill you. That was just the stupidest thing to me, but, you know. Stupidity yeah. is a currency that was not running dry this, this season. Yeah. Um, um, yeah, it, uh, that to me, I understand the whole point of him saying it was supposed to be, oh, this is going to emotionally cripple him, and I'll just be able to take advantage of him in a weakened state and whoop his ass handedly, uh, and then uh, he just gets fucked over <laughs> like completely like uh I don't, I don't know so like these flashbacks to me 
I guess I can kind of see them in like a couple of different lights. And, and to me, it's it doesn't matter what you show me. John Kreese is the bad guy. You know, Obviously. he's never he's never going to get redeemed. He's never going to, you know, he's there's never going to be justification for his actions. No matter what you show me. Yeah, I get it. The love of his life wrapped her car around a tree. That was the show's words, by Trying the way. Trying to get away from a relationship, was she? <laughs> yeah. Um, but, like, there are some shows and some movies where the tragic backstory works. And it makes you really see from the antagonist slash villain's point of view. John Kreese is not one of those characters. He's not made to be – he's not supposed to be sympathetic. He's not supposed to get sympathy or empathetic – have empathy. Any of the – John Kreese isn't supposed to have emotions. He is supposed yeah. to be a fighting machine who wants to win, crush, dominate, destroy, and take over everything he sees in front of him. And he does that through training the young minds around him and manipulating them in the ways of, you know, sport karate. Um it, so, like, yes, I, they, they set up a backstory for Kreese, and we know more about his character. That's cool enough, but, like, if you're – I hope they weren't trying to make him seem like, oh, well, he's, you know, he's not perfect either. It's like we know he's not perfect. Humans aren't perfect, but I don't give a shit. Whoop his ass. I think <laughs> I, I think this is partly the issue with any type of long-form media in, in 2021 – we think sometimes that because we get a sympathetic backstory that that's supposed to redeem someone, and that's kind of the inherent idea. Because like whenever you read one of these dumbass articles, we, you know, so and so can be redeemed, or here's why so and so isn't as bad as you. Think. Like, we're always trying to be th- like that society, trying to break down the villainary arc of someone. But sometimes the backstory exists just to explain how this person is so ir- irredeemable. Like, there's nothing about John Kreese that is redeemable in the eyes of anyone because you can yeah. go two ways from a tragedy. And John Kreese clearly went into the, I'm going to ruin everyone's life because I don't care anymore. And that's not redeemable. Like, it's one thing to be John. Like, you know, Johnny isn't a bad dude. He just keeps getting his own way. Kreese is a bad dude. And there's no redeeming that. But at least now yeah. we know why he's a bad dude. But the problem that I have with these shows is that we often just kind of assume that everyone is a good person at birth and that you only become a bad person through some traumatic means. It's the anti-superhero story. I would have loved it if John Chris was just a sociopath that ripped off Tales of Squirrels. Not that I think you should. I think that's awful. But I think if you have a character who's like, yeah, I'm just going to snap the next bunnies and laugh about it, I think that sets up who, who he should have been as a villain a lot easier. That being said, though, I absolutely loved Betsy. So I, I, I'm, I, I'm torn. I make Crease a sociopath, yes, but also I love Betsy. So, like, I don't know. I'm, I'm conflicted. Sure. <laughs> she, she's so cute. She's like, oh, like, I don't want y'all to fight. And then Crease all like, oh, bam, oh, bam, oh, bam. Hey, you kid. I don't know why you still uh, Ryu fireballs, but you know he is. I do, I do like the fact that they do subvert our expectations with the first flashback of the jock pulling up to the diner and uh, you know being an asshole to everybody, and then of course you know that's not Crease; it's the nerdy dishwasher who gets beat up by the the jerk. Mm-hmm. Um, it's like ah, well you know, okay. Um, and I will say that the casting for young Crease, did, they did a phenomenal job. I mm-hmm. really like that kid. His performance was awesome. I don't know who they got to play young Crease, but I really enjoyed him a lot. Um, but yeah, I just I don't I don't care about John Crease's backstory. So what? Like it? I again, I don't think it was a waste of time, but it was also just like something. It was just unneeded. It was unnecessary. So that's fair. Mark, any thoughts on young Crease? By the by, it was Robert Kavanaugh. No, Car- Car- Carnahan. Robert Carnahan. That's who played the young priest. Robert Carnahan. According to uh, the karatekid.fandom.wiki. Okay. 
Marcus, any thoughts on uh, Young Crease? I think we lost Marcus momentarily. Well, yeah, well the way. I got no, there you are. Right. Oh. Yeah, yeah. Um, sorry, I muted myself. But um, yeah, I agree with Squish, man. I actually got to play it. I really liked. Um, and then, like I said, the whole down the scene I thought was great. The, the situation with the girl was heartbreaking, considering the fact that it was like she wrapped her car around a tree. So that that imagery is is on some you know another level. Um, but when it comes to Crease. It's interesting because he, he kind of let that, I guess he failed to act, define the rest of his life. Um, and, and I wonder if, you know, so many, you know, Hollywood in certain instances with uh, creatives kind of stuck on like, you know, if we can, you know, recreate kind of like the, you know, Batman's alley scene where like that one pivotal moment defined it all. Like, uh, like at this point, he's choosing to allow that. You know, mm-hmm. it, it wasn't necessarily the most traumatic thing. Like, it, it was traumatic, but it's like at this point, he's continuously choosing uh, to do that. Like, we see instances in this season where he obviously has a, a, a love for Johnny like a son, but it's so twisted that it, it's completely unhealthy. And he has, I guess the only th- other person he can connect to in this world besides Johnny on some sick level is the other guy that's in his, uh, that was in his unit. But even that is is an attachment to like you know I owe you, you know like a life favor or something. So even that is is a bit of manipulation. So like Swiss, and you was talking about like this guy's just intrinsically, you know, in, in a way in a way bad. If there was some type of redemption for him, it's, it's kind of gone. And I, you know maybe in another life if he can meet back up with the girl he lost, maybe. But you know I think that guy kind of, you know, was left back on that snake pit uh, ladder. Correction, it's Barrett <clears throat> Carnahan. Barrett Carnahan? Yeah. Okay. Um, and I think uh, just to get to, to play off Marcus's point again, um, it, do you see the – I think they established that hero complex in uh, Crease at the beginning of, like, he's willing to go to any length in the military to be a he, – he says it over and over again, I'm here to be a hero. I want to be a hero. And I think he is forever stuck in his mind of no matter what he does, he's the hero. So he can be as evil and gross and disgusting and twisted as he wants because no matter what, at the end of the day, he's going to he's going to see himself as the good guy. He's going to see himself as what is best and what is right for these children and um, you know, for this little section of California. And that the way he thinks is the best way of thinking. So it's just kind of like, I, I, even without the death of of Betsy, I think he was just, he this idea that he was going to be a hero was so set in his mind from the start that he was going to go to any length to prove himself to be a hero. Yeah, so oh, it's entirely possible. So, so yeah, let, let's cover the departure two characters real fast. Uh, Aisha and Stingray. Did not appear in this season. <laughs> and I'm going to be honest. I know there's a lot of people like, oh, my God, I love that. No, they're both terrible characters. I'm glad they're gone. Bye. Uh, um, Aisha, Aisha, her departure is a little more jarring just because of her prominence in season, like toward the end of season one and season two. Sting, Stingray was a nothing character. You could get you could have never had him in the show. Um an adult man in a karate class for kids beating up children. Like, you get over yourselves. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I, it didn't detract. I, there, nothing was really detracted from the show through their departures. So, I mean, it. it yeah, I guess, I guess, cool, they're gone, woo. Eh. I mean, they brought yeah. nothing to the table, in my opinion. Marcus, I'm sorry to step on your toes. No, no, you're good. I mean, it's it's she literally got you know the Aisha character, and it's and it's weird because I, I saw a couple of people talk about like the actress uh, probably really could have uh, you know used back being on the show because she was going through some financial woes. But that character kind of ran out of road because it's like all they were probably gonna have her do is basically what we got with Tori, and then pulled the hawk. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But- we got Tori and we got Hawks, so you you know by process of elimination, you kind of just got you know 
you know, pushed out. And then, you know, bringing in the character that was bullying Hawk to push him towards a, a, a potential new role. So, you know, she kind of, you know, the um, process, you know, the numbers just didn't add up, you know. Right. And I feel like she really did run out of room confrontation with the the mean girl of the school who uh kind of falls over a new leaf in season three um like she she did what she wants this was the only person in the school being shitty to her besides the uh what what's the other girl's name moon um the hippie the hippie girl yeah um she was kind of shitty to aisha too but she redeemed herself in season two yeah um and, you know, kind of realized that this was all ridiculous. So, like, the only people who are being shitty to her now have no reason to be shitty to her anymore because she proved herself against one, and the other just kind of came to the realization that she was being a bitch. So, like, where do you take this character from here? Again, like you said, she either becomes Tori or she becomes Hawk, and if you have those roles filled already, you don't need the character. So. I was just very unimpressed with her. She was, I in mean, my yeah. opinion, she was the weakest parts of the first two seasons, so. That's just how it is. Yeah. So, the last I, two characters. I, mean, I, can't, I can't disagree with you, so. The last two characters we have are Dimitri and Hawk, and, and they're interwoven in this season. Um, Dimitri doesn't really have a standoff arc of his own besides hooking up with that one chick that's friends with Moon. Yeah. I forget her name. But that was funny. I forget so. her name, too. <laughs> Is something it was, it was, it was? I think it was Yasmin. Was that was that who that was? Oh, I was just gonna name a front red, uh, front uh, wedgie, but you know. That's, front wedgie. Front um, wedgie works. I, you you might be right. I'll double check. Yeah, it's Yasmin. Okay. So, Yasmin and and Dimitri started a thing, which is hilarious, but. Hawk is conflicted throughout most of the season because he sees his buddy uh, Miguel all laid up. And when Miguel transferred there, it was Dimitri and, and Hawk. Those were the first two dudes that were cool to, to him. So, like, you know, there, there's that bond between the three of them. But as things progress throughout the season, it's not so much that Hawk has a problem with the way Crease is handling things. I think it's more or less that Hawk has a problem with the way he's adapting to how Crease is handling things. Because they bring in the bullies, if you will, to, to try out for Cobra Kai, and they give Hawk one of the, the, the uh, more rotund individuals, and Hawk fucking goes American History X on the dude's ass. Like, he beats the shit out of him to the point where I'm like, how is this not a hate crime? Like, that was violent and nasty. Yeah. So I think Hawk starts to realize that he's going off too much of a cliff. And then, you know, it, it, things are culminating and, and building up within Hawk. You know, Dimitri and company tries to convince Hawk to join Fang Eagle or Eagle Fang or whatever it's fucking called, which is just the worst name. It's the most 80s worst name ever. But things aren't going the way he wants. And then he starts to see that the way Tori is kind of going off the deep end. And then that culminates in, in, in the fight that just, oh, my God, the fight. At the LaRusso house, and he sees Miguel, who spent his entire, you know, seasonal arc, which is, I guess, the equivalent of a year, because, like, I think it was, like, the start of the school year, and then by the time of the fight, it was near the end of the school year. So it's kind of implied that it's at least been a few months. And he's seeing his buddy get his ass kicked by one of the new Cobra Kai guys, and it's just like, you know, he's had enough. And Hawk and Dimitri, you know, go fucking Power Rangers on the rest of Cobra Kai, and it's the best goddamn scene in co- in Karate Kid history. Yeah, it's, yeah. It's uh that that clearly this is their hallway, that that Daredevil hallway stuff. <laughs> um, I didn't really the whole mass fight thing kind of. I got you know this is kind of where it drew uh, weary on me if you will because like oh here we go again but it was the moments like with Miguel and the moments like with Hawk that kind of turned it up also the interaction with uh, you know Tor and, and, and Sam but going with Hawk man you know it was interesting you know contrasting between him and Demetri because he tried to change everything about him to get w- results that he thought he wanted and Demetri didn't change anything about himself Besides some self-defense, he ended up getting the girl. 
you know, which I thought was uh, was interesting. But you know, it, it's funny he that conversation that um, what I think it was when Johnny came to the school was like the dude don't care about you. You're just pieces on a chessboard for him. And I think slowly but surely he you know he went to Cobra Kai and, and changed everything about himself so he could feel special. And Crease just proved to him that he wasn't special. He was replaceable. Mm-hmm. Right. You, know, you did all that, and the dude brought in the dude that basically, you know, was the reason why you came there in the first place. And, you know, you're supposed to work with this guy now, and, and then he, he's, he's changing the dynamics of everything, got you turning on your, you know, your supposed best friend, you broke his arm, and, you know, the whole thing with, you know, Miguel, and it's just... It was cool to see, you know. I don't, I don't want this this show to constantly turn into, a, a, you know, a big show with these kids with these hill and face turns. But uh, <laughs> it, it was, it was well, really cool to see. I, I didn't know that's what you meant. That's what you meant, like the actual big show, like Paul White. And I was about to go what Chad. I was about to do what Chad just did and go well. <laughs> yeah. Well. It was it, it was cool to see, man. That the whole the situation with Hawk, it was real cool to see because he say if it wasn't Dimitri, it wouldn't it wouldn't have landed it the way that it did, you know. Yeah. So, um, to go off your point, I I actually really like that. I really like that um, because think when you think about Hawk and how he started off and how he changed everything about himself kind of under the guidance of Johnny because Johnny told him to be more confident and to be more badass. And these things help him stand out and help him feel better about himself until they turned into symbols of, you know, just flat out rage. Um, and, and it really does. I think this season three is this is where he really does see the difference between crease and Johnny Lawrence and that Johnny genuinely gave a shit about these kids. Mm hmm. It wasn't just about creating a, a bunch of killers. He wanted to make them feel better about themselves. Now, granted, his teaching, the way that he teaches, is completely ridiculous, and he's still a, a goofball of a character. Um, but he, he genuinely had a connection with all these kids in helping build up their confidence and make them feel good about themselves. Um, and I think Hawk finally came to that realization of he got everything he wanted with Johnny. And then as soon as Kreese took over, he lost everything he wanted. He had Moon, they were dating, and then he lost her. Um, you know, so it really just goes to show that he like he had his epiphany, he had his moment of clarity of like, fuck, this this kid who's supposed to be a nerd and a dork, and he's he's got a ten thousand piece Lego set volcano in the school cafeteria is still getting everything he wants and I, I don't have shit because I'm an I'm just an asshole. Uh so yeah, I th- I think as as much as I didn't like Hawk in season 2, I think they really did a good job of redeeming his character in season 3. Totally agree. Marcus Anything else you got about Hawk? Uh, no, I mean, it was just uh, going back to those moments of, uh, I guess, them building, like, slow building. But like I said, they they brought the bully in, and, and he practically got replaced by him on the aggression tip because the, 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 the guy knew wrestling, and he was just an overall douche, which, you know, really just turns crease on, I would imagine. <laughs> uh, in the situation with the snakes, you thought, you know, thinking he was a cool kid, and it's like, <laughs> uh, you, you're not going to drink a beer? I don't need to drink a beer to feel cool. That was a situation, and then he was the one that got the snake when that was supposed to be his thing. So it was like, I have been completely outshined here. Like, why am I, like, what is going on? I'm supposed to be the top dog, and I'm getting knocked down a peg at every point. So, you know, I might as well just go back to being me with this confidence and see how that works. And I think it's it's a little bit deeper than that. Also, I think he definitely missed those friendships because, it's you know, you can only uh, – you know, be around Tor for so long, I can imagine. <laughs> I I mean, <laughs> Peyton List is gorgeous, but you're right, that character. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Are, are those all the major character arcs for the season? Yes. Okay, because I have like a minor one that I just want to talk about because I just came to a stunning realization about something. Okay. <clears throat> so, um... Just a little minor thing. Uh, they rehired uh, Daniel's cousin, uh, Louie, at yeah. the dealership. This and he's season. great. Uh, 
and he's great. He's he's not the bumbling idiot that he was in season one. Um, Louis LaRusso is played by Brett Ernst, mm-hmm. who I, I knew I knew him from somewhere. He was one of the commentators in Wrestling Society X. <laughs> That's great. Uh, I like. I was fantastic. like. I recognize him from somewhere. He was in wrestling. He was one of the commentators in uh, Wrestling Society X. That's insane to me. <laughs> I love that. That's fantastic. So, all right. <laughs> the we we kind of hit every point. Yeah. Well, well, well. There's still one dang on. So, the end of the season isn't the the the. The, the house fight. It's actually a battle at Cobra Kai proper when Johnny gets back from his date with um, Elizabeth Shue. He, he realizes that he really wants to be with Carmen. So he gets back and he's kind of, you know, he's strutting and, and you know, he, he, he's doing his little thing and then he sees Carmen and Carmen's kind of upset and he's like, all right, listen, I, I almost kissed her. And, and then she's like, wait, what? And he's like, wait, what? And it's revealed that um, there was a fight, and that sends Johnny back into the, you know, as George St. Pierre would say, the dark place inside of my head. So John dashes on over to, to, to Cobra Kai, and he gets into, you know, he's, he's, he's going to fight a 79 year old John Kreese to death, apparently. And then that's where fucking Stepford's son is there. He's like, join Cobra Kai. Just, just fucking repeating it, like, one of us, one of us. So he and Kreese get into it, and then he accidentally knocks his son out. And he's like, oh, man, I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to. And then Kreese is like, what, what do you use? Like some type of like brass knuckle or knife or something? And he, and he knocks out Johnny. And then LaRusso shows up, and he's like, all right, let's do this. And then they get into a fight. And I'm just thinking to myself, how is 80-year-old John Kreese able to kick the shit out of two 50-year-old men? I don't even know. <laughs> yeah. I <laughs> was done. Go ahead. Marcus. No, I was just saying hello. It, it just made, really made me miss Arrow. <laughs> like, <laughs> the, the cuts, and I'm like, what am I watching? Raw Underground, man? <laughs> so, Daniel obviously busts out his, his uh, Mi- uh, Miyagi death technique, Sun Crease, and, and that ends the fight. And then, like, the, the students show up, and they're like, no, don't, don't kill John Crease. And then. Fucking Johnny's kid is like, Dad, if I ever see you again, I'll kill you or whatever nonsense. And everyone just kind of slings home. And then, like, the very next scene, all the kids are in the backyard of Miyagi's house. Miyagi's like, Danielson, get these fuckers out my house. <laughs> um, so I, I want to I re-bring up a point uh, that Marcus made earlier. Um, so when Johnny gets there and he starts whooping uh, on John Kreese's ass, that's when... Robbie comes out, and you made the comparison of Robbie being like Anakin Skywalker. They rever- they had a reverse Darth Vader moment, like Darth Vader and Luke, where Robbie's like, join me, and together we will rule the Reseda, California. We'll rule the, <laughs> the Tri-County Valley, the All Valley, yeah, the as, tri- as son and father. Valley. As son and father. And I'm, <laughs> and I'm really sitting here like, oh, my God. He really is just Anakin Skywalker. (laughs) Like, man, first off, this whole thing is absolutely ridiculous. Uh, Because John Kreese, like, with how good, and Kreese has said this a million times over, that for as good as he was, Johnny was the best. And Johnny is the best. And that's why he keeps trying to recruit Johnny back to his side throughout season three. Um so, there, like, first off, I don't think that Kreese could take Johnny one-on-one, let alone take Johnny and arguably somebody who's on the same skill level as Johnny and Daniel LaRusso uh, and just be able to walk it, like, and be able to hold his own. I think Kreese should have gotten his ass whooped. Now, granted, I know Robbie tried... <laughs> I, I, could, I couldn't get through that without the mental image of him pushing Robbie into that locker <laughs> and knocking him unconscious. It made me laugh. Um... But yeah, it, like I, I know Robbie got involved and Kreese tried to cheat uh, with weapons and stuff like that. But like they really should have just whooped his ass. And then the students are all like, no, save it for the All Valley tournament. We'll win. Uh, it's like, well, we could just we just beat the shit out of him right here and break his legs, you know, and like just be done with it. And they're like, no, 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 we'll do this legally. OK. <laughs> Johnny literally gave Daniel the OK to kill him. Yeah. 
the kids show up. No. <laughs> like, we're going to do this the correct way. I'm like, we're going to do this the legal way now? This entire season has been nothing but a legality. What are you talking about? <laughs> Summer Thomas Jane is very unhappy with the events of this season. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the 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 season ends with all the kids you know crashing Miyagi's backyard barbecue party and all of a sudden uh, Daniel's like the fuck where'd, where'd half these kids come from and then Johnny walks out and he's like the fuck you get in here latch was unlocked oh, god damn it <laughs> So, so then you have Johnny and Daniel as co senseis. Is it senseis? <laughs> Miyagi, Miyagi Fang. <laughs> Miyagi Fang karate. Miyagi uh, Fang. And, and the season kind of ends on two lingering ideas. One, it's the combination of Miyagi Do and Tiger Fang or Hawk Fang or Fang. Eagle Fang. Whatever. Joining into one conglomerate, and then on the flip side, it's Crease making a call to Terry Silver, being like, "Hey, I need your help again." And I'm just like, ah. especially if they bring in Dan- uh, what was his name, Daniel Barnes? Was that his name? Michael Barnes? Uh, I think it was Mike Barnes, wasn't it? Oh god, if they bring in Mike Barnes as well. Oh my god, this season four is gonna be even better. Uh... <laughs> Now, now I'm thinking about it. You know, this reminds me of uh, you remember the end, the end into you got served when the, when the the little um, Omarion's crew joined with the little Saints. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Oh man, it's like okay, this is gonna be uh, intriguing because because uh, obviously now I'm guessing that Robbie is gonna go through the transformation of full Vader. Unfortunately, uh, yes, it was Mike Barnes, and he was played by Sean Canaan. So, can I also just point out one simple thing about um, Tanner Buchanan, who plays Robbie Keane, that I, I don't think anyone, one of us, have has noticed until now? It's not that he's my height and and, and twenty four or twenty two. It's not that he's from Lima, Ohio. Do you really want to know what bothers us about him that we haven't realized until right now? Because it, it kind of encapsulates what the show is in today's generation. Robbie Keane is essentially Adam Banks from Mighty Ducks. Why did you say that? Because you know it's true. <laughs> Why would you put that thought in my head? You, and that's this show is basically Mighty Ducks. They literally I mean, have... The poor group and the rich group. They, they, they have the evil hockey team slash karate dojo. Somehow they made martial arts into a, a team combat sport. Fair enough. That's basically hockey. That's what this show has become. Mm-hmm. It, it's basically Mighty Ducks the, the, the show, which is actually going to be a thing. They're, they're doing Mighty Ducks the show, but, you know, whatever. Yeah. I was I was more of a fan of the the, of the animated cartoon, but Crease is old enough to be a dragon, so I guess. <laughs> be honest. So. Uh, quack quack quack, Mister Ducksworth. All right. So, is there any moments, episodes, or what have you that stuck out to you that you want to comment on? Um, let me see here. Let me think. I mean, um, I just like the biggest impactful moments for me uh, in season three is the the stuff. Honestly, the stuff between Chosen and Daniel. Mm-hmm. Um, just Chosen's initial reaction towards Daniel, and every time Daniel's like, "I'm gonna get another drink," and Chosen's like, "No." Let me get it. I insist. Um, and, and he's just so he angry. <laughs> he's angry, but like, it's the respect for Daniel. He doesn't want to respect Daniel, but he does because Daniel spared his life. Mm-hmm. And because of that, it helped kind of turn Chosen's life around. Mm-hmm. Um, but he still has, you know, he still has to prove himself. Uh, you know, that he needs Daniel to respect him back. Mm-hmm. Uh, 
and the, the whole interactions in the the dojo uh, and him learning about the Miyagi death techniques uh, really are, really are really powerful, and I think it helps. It kind of takes Daniel from being in a rough spot as like the semi antagonist of the series and really turning him full. You know, this was Daniel's full baby face moment of like, all right, we're redeeming Daniel and uh, and making him a good guy again. He was never a bad guy, but yeah. Yeah, it's yeah for me. I, I gotta go with episode four, man. That that trip back to Okinawa, man, and even the start of it with the bartender going like, like, what are you talking about? Like, you know, here we, you know, we never fully lose people, mm-hmm. you know, and just that yeah. concept. Of being, and then when he, you know, back at that that just that amazingly shot scene of them back at, uh, I guess, uh, Kumiko's aunt's you know, house. Yeah, Ann's house and how, you know, just like there was the pond and everything. And, you know, when she read them letters and how emotional both of them got it, just specifically Daniel, like it just reaffirmed every decision that Miyagi ever made in terms of mentoring that kid, you know. And, um, you know, you kind of, he kind of not getting to be with him in his last moments, he really got to kind of have like a last conversation with him if you will i thought just thought that was beautiful and that whole episode was great even with the the super convenience of the little girl that he saved you know uh literally was the the missing piece of the puzzle that he came to okinawa to get so um between that and just and this is a petty moment um when daniel basically called sam out for being kind of thotty <laughs> <laughs> He was on the floor. It's like, yeah, damn, baby girl, another one. <laughs> like, it's a pattern. Like, you got to slow up. Now, nah? like, you got to at least take it somewhere I can't see it. Like, this is kind of why we're in the situation in the first place. Like, dad, like, no dad, nothing. It's gonna be a whole nother season of this crap because you can't keep your lip genity. Like, <laughs> you know. So, yeah, that, that's fair. Um, I'm right there with you. Uh, definitely the Okinawa stuff, but I'm gonna I'm gonna go with the the fight scene at the end, in in, in uh, the last episode. Uh, mostly just because of, of how fucking crazy it was, and then you know the the, the face turned by Hawk, and you know Sam using uh, the the weaponry to take down Tori, like all of that just kind of flowed in, flowed into one another, and, and it worked so damn well. Um, at the at the end, you know, it it just it was a, a perfect season. With, with maybe not perfect, but it, but it was as as good of a season as it could have been. So yeah, de- you know, de- definitely into uh, into season four, and, and and we'll see how that goes. Uh, are you guys excited about the use of Terry Silver, Marcus? Yeah, I am. I mean, you know, this just gives Chris another ally because clearly he's lost Johnny for good with the with the kill threat that he gave him, uh, rightfully so. But. Um, yeah, I mean, look, they haven't missed yet in terms of, you know, respecting all of what, like, they're kind of doing it like the Mandalorian in terms of, like, the creators, like, look, we get fan service, but if it's not going to fit the narrative and, and move it along and improve it, or, or we can't, you know, um, bring something that, that makes sense with this thing, we're not going to do it. So, you know, and the fact that they're getting the same actors to come back, you know, I definitely appreciate it. So, yeah, I'm, I'm definitely looking forward to, like, as nonsensical, like Swift said, is the whole point of this tournament at this point. That it damn near should be a gun warfare by now. <laughs> but, you know, they're going to try to do this, you know, the legal way. And, and uh, maybe that was the one thing we didn't talk about, like, them convincing that council to even have the tournament. That was a good moment, too. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, because, you know, those three came together and it was just... Uh, very much knuckleheaded, and then it was the kids that turned stuff around. So uh, that was that was another cool moment that I really dug. But yeah, I'm definitely looking forward to season four. Real quick, do you guys think like after this, like th- does it need to drag out past the season four? I wouldn't see why not. I think you got to go um, Scrubs um, med school route, though. If you go into a season five. Go away from Johnny and Daniel. Like, they can be part of the show still, but it needs to focus on someone else a- as the new mains. Because John and Daniel are the new- are the mains. So, 
you know, make it Miguel's story and and, and um, Sam's story or, or or what have you. Like, I really go into the idea of it almost being a spinoff of sorts. Because I think this universe is ripe for more. Plus, we haven't gotten Hillary Swank yet. We don't know if we're getting Mike Barnes. It's like they're still there. There's still meat on this this nostalgia bone. <clears throat> yeah, um, I could definitely see them wrapping it up next season. Um, the big finale of of beating Crease and everything like that. And y- there is definitely more. And you have to make the 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 thing is is if they do more, I, I agree with Chad. Um, instead of doing nostalgia of the threat being Crease and the threat of Johnny and Daniel's past catching up with them and causing having consequences on a new generation. It's time for the new generation to start having problems of their own that aren't based around the problems of their fathers slash mentors. Um, and that, that would be where they would have to kind of take, take it in order to kind of make it work because I have a feeling I don't know. If they don't wrap it up next season, the Kreese storyline, uh, then we're only going to get one more season out of that, and that's just so they'll do. Because it seems like they're doing a movie a season now. So we got we got Karate Kid 2. We're going to get Karate Kid 3 next season with uh, Terry Silver coming back. So it's like, do they move on to the uh, was it, the next Karate Kid was number four mm-hmm. um, with Hilary Swank? So it's like, I could see them trying to do that, but at the same time, they've set themselves up to wrap it up perfectly. So... Uh, I'm not going to complain if they do keep it going as long as it is still the same quality of what we're getting now. Mm-hmm. Um, that's really all it comes down to. I don't, I don't care about what it's about as long as it, as whatever it is about is the same quality. Um, as far as Terry Silver goes, we talked about this when we talked about Karate Kid 3. Terry Silver was the best villain that the Karate Kid series has had. He really was just ruthless and fucking mean and a son of a bitch the entire time. So uh, I think for Kreese to have to call on him again and bring him back means that you know shit's getting serious. Um, and not only that, but, I mean, Terry Silver was the one who almost who almost convinced Daniel to turn to the dark side. Mm-hmm. You know? So Ter- Terry Silver, I mean, he's a bad motherfucker. He ain't a man to mess with. Um, so... I, I'm I'm excited for it. I think next season is going to be really good. If if they continue on this trend of every <clears throat> every season just gets better than the last, um, then I don't see why season four won't be one of the best pieces of television ever produced. Yeah. So I'm, I'm right there with you, Marcus. A- a- any final thoughts? No, man. I'm just. Uh... It, it felt like forever in a day, but it was it was well worth the wait. You know? Absolutely. Swisher, any final thoughts? Uh, yeah. Why was there an entire scene about sixteen-year-olds in bikinis washing cars? You overthink things. That's, because kind of gross. <laughs> because none of them are actually sixteen. In fact, Sam is twenty-four. Right. <laughs> right. I know. I get that. But like the implication. Also, <laughs> I love the the, the 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 big guy just jumps on the hood. You want a car? <laughs> you want to wash? I didn't need them wet man boobs. No man. <laughs> but I love I love Marcus saying that Daniel absolutely called Sam out. He's like he's like, all right, you were with Miguel. All right, let me follow this train of thought, Sam. Hold on, Miguel, and then Robbie, and then you were fighting with Miguel, and then Robbie. Now you're fighting with Robbie, but now you're back with Miguel. What is happening? <laughs> just, 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 just the scene. And they set it up so just it was the scene was cliche as hell. They're kissing due to shot of them, their head split, and now he's standing in between them. You're kissing the cripple. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, my favorite they absolutely could have made in that whole scene, Miguel has the little uh taiko drum, the little toy drum in his pocket. <laughs> And I'm like, are they going to make the, is that a toy drum in your pocket joke? They didn't. I was like, I was really concerned. They didn't, unfortunately. <laughs> they could have. By, by the way, I cringe every time something in that room happens. Like, y'all just effing up all the Miyagi memorabilia. Remember, oh. really? <laughs> Miyagi. 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 God damn it. I can't do it. 
It's there. I know it's there. Miagabelia. 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 Okay. I also love the fact that that's literally a joke in, in, in the movie. Like, you collect Mr. Miyagi things. I have a thing of Mr. Miyagi things, but you can't have them. And then he gives it to him. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Chosen, you're, you're, a, you're a man of conviction. All right. So, I guess we're done. Because we, we tackled all the big arcs. We, we, we talked about all the great moments. Can't think of anything else. Um, so, we'll be back for season four. In a year. <laughs> so, so, you know, hopefully we're all still alive for 2022. That's going to be a weird year. For Marcus Green, you can find him on his Twitter at Paradox Kid, P A R A D O X K I D, as well as on his other That's podcast, me. The True Penny Show, T R U E P E N N Y S H O W. I cut you off, Marcus. I'm so sorry. Swisher, no, you can be found where? Um, you can find me on Twitter at x two thousand Gregs. That's x two zero 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 G R E G S. You can find me on Instagram uh, on at two thousand Gregs uh, two zero 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 G R E G S. Chad, you can find me on Twitter Chad Nerd Corp C H A D N E R D C O R P and on the Instagram at Chad's Photo. Be sure to go to the website realnerdcorp.com, R E A L N E R D C O R P dot com, as well as finding us on Twitter at N E R D C O R P and on Instagram at Real Nerd Corp. Swisher and I will be back next week, although I do not know what we are going to talk about. Marcus and I are going to be on Tuesday. And Marcus, if you thought I was kidding about us booking a show of active WCW talent for a WCW revival show, you are mistaken. We are doing that. And I will even send you a list of people I found active in the last year or two to build our card. That's going to be on Wednesday show, Tuesday show over at twitch.tv backslash rushing underground. Be sure to follow us on twitch.tv backslash wrestling around and on this channel at twitch.tv backslash. Is it Real Nerd Corp? I think it's Real Nerd Corp. You can also find us on Real YouTube Nerd at Real Nerd Corp by searching Real Nerd Corp in the search bar and on uh, YouTube as well at uh, Wrestling Underground, at The Wrestling Underground on, on YouTube. So I think I got all the, all the, uh, the personals and all the uh, important links and whatnot. So I guess we're done. Yeah, Chad, I would love for you to do a whole nother outro, but we're out of time. We got to go. Thank you for listening. We're out of time.